We're on the last week today of our Pillow Talk series. It has been about sex, and it's generated all kinds of interesting discussions for me, as you might imagine. I must have had five people come and say essentially the same thing after week one. It went something like this. Yeah, Greg, we were talking about what you were going to say, and it was actually good. Which I think is such an interesting way to engage me after my, like, surprisingly, it was good. <laughs> Um, and we were talking, about, anyway, it's kind of, kind of wild. I had somebody suggest after week one, they said, hey, Greg, you know, you did that part a few months ago where you had us text in your questions and then you answered them on the spot. Why not do that on week three of the sex series? I said, no, 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 we are, <laughs> we are not doing that. Uh, every Tuesday at noon, our staff uh, meets together to pray. And we pray for all of you, for our church and for God's work in your lives. And then we have lunch together. And at lunch this past week, someone was noting that we have this anomaly in our children's ministry numbers where we have just a surge of first graders. We have 20 first graders that come on Thursday night. We have about 20 first graders that come at 9 o'clock. Another 20 first graders that come at 1030. It's kind of wild. And then someone else on the staff spoke up. They said, yeah, we actually went back and did the research and we found out the last time you did a sex series, Greg, was seven years ago. <laughs> Coincidence? Hmm, I'll let you decide. But today's message is a candid message from a particular passage of the scriptures that has an aim both for those of you who are single, and I know single means a lot of things. It could mean you're a high school student, it could mean you're in your 20s, it could mean you're divorced, it could mean you're widowed, it's for all of that, and also an element of the passage that is for married people. And so for us to begin today, I want to actually ask each one of those groups to consider a question that I think can kind of guide your thought process as you go through the message. So this First question is for those of you who are single. I want, I want you to think kind of which of these three categories would you put yourself in? There are some people who are single and they're quite content being single. They actually imagine that they will be single for the rest of their lives, that, that this is who they are. It might even be part of their identity or a gift from God. And they're single and quite content to, to think of the rest of their lives as single. Maybe that's you. There are some people who are single and they're content to currently be single. But they do imagine that over the course of their life, as it unfolds, that someone will come into their life, they will engage in a, a relationship and eventually be married, and so you don't need it right now, but you definitely anticipate that at a future season of your life. And there are other people who are single and quite discontent being single right now. It, it's almost as if they'd want nothing more than to have someone else in their life right now, to be in a marriage, in a shared relationship. The loneliness, the, those factors are, are defining for, for people in that category, and so I want you to think about how you think about yourself. Which one of those categories would you put yourself in as we walk through this teaching and this message? For those of you who are married, same thing. I kind of have three categories. I, I can imagine you'll fit into one of these. I want you to think about your marriage and the sexual relationship within your marriage. And to think, okay, in our marriage, is sex too big of a deal? Is, is it too frequent? Is it too often? Or, second category, would you say, yeah, sex, it's, it's part of our marriage, it's eh, but marriage is kind of eh, like it's, it's kind of in the middle. Or would you be a person who says, yeah, in our marriage, um, we don't share in this enough. We don't share in, in sex and romance and things like that enough. I think the scriptures are going to speak to people who find themselves in, in different places with that. And I want you just to think about where you are in your life right now. So as I jump into the message, let me start actually where I started two weeks ago with this uh, simple idea. I want Pillow Talk, this three-week series, to start conversations between you and your spouse, you and the person you're dating, you and your kids, you and God, and also to lift the conversation about sex. So let me name these three ways that I want the conversation to be lifted again. First, I want it to be lifted from being casual to being sacred. Now, I think we could probably all agree that culturally, outside the church, sex is a pretty casual conversation. I wish it were more sacred. But let's just talk about inside the church for a while. Because my experience growing up in church, and maybe yours if you did, the, the whole conversation about sex went something like this. Hey, girls, cover yourself up. Hey, guys, control yourself. And don't have sex till you're married. You got it? Good. Let's quit talking about it. And that was kind of the whole thing. And I think, oh, when it gets reduced to a few rules, what we miss is that the scriptures actually have a holistic, thoughtful, consistent concept of how marriage and sexuality and relationships all work together. And so I always want to lift that conversation back up to be a little more sacred, a little more lofty. Second, I want to move the conversation from being physical to being relational. 
I'm going to teach today from 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And when you read this passage, if you only see the conversation about sexuality in terms of the physicalness of this, you'll miss the whole point. You'll miss the whole thing. Actually, when the scriptures talk about sexuality, this is one of the primary things it does, both negatively or warning-wise and positively. It says, no, sex is about so much more than the physical. In fact, when it talks about sexual sin, rebellion against God, here's what it says. It says, all other sins a man commits outside of his body, but sexual sin is different. It has something to do with who you are and your identity, and we don't categorize regular abuse and sexual abuse in the same way. Because there's something about our identity, our relational being that is shaped by sexuality. And on the positive side, I can promise you this, when the scriptures talk about sex and sexuality, they're not just talking about a physical moment or a physical experience. They're not. It's so much more than that. And I want people to have have an appreciation it is so much more than that. The passage I'm going to teach, which I know you haven't seen yet, but when, I, when it unfolds, um, I'm curious if, for your take on it. I had a person I was listening to who taught this passage once, and he was trying to narrow it down and keep it simple. But in trying to keep it simple, this is what he said was the point of the passage. He said, here's the point. Before you're married, no sex. After you're married, lots of sex. And... I remember kind of mentioning that in a message one time, and I had a number of people come up to me afterwards, mostly women, but not entirely women. And they said, hey, Greg, let me tell you about my experience. Before I was married, lots of romance. After we're married, no romance. And I think that's that's a fundamental idea here, that, that sex isn't just about an experience or a physical experience. It's so much broader than that, and you have to think of it as such, about how you relate and how you pursue someone, how you relate in all the hours that you're not in bed together. The third piece I want to move is from receiving to giving. And if sex is relational, and it is, then this has to be the fundamental biblical principle because this is the fundamental biblical principle of all relationships. Now, let me kind of circle back to something. Just a few minutes ago, I asked those of you who were married to kind of categorize your sex life. Too much, just right, too little. And my guess is when I asked that question, when you thought about the answer to it, you thought about your answer to it. Like, you ran it through your own experience. What do I think about my marriage? Too much, just right, not enough. But in a healthy relationship, when presented with a question like that, we would not answer the question in light of our own needs. Because that's all about receiving. That's all about being self-centered. It's all about what's in it for me. Instead, the place our mind would go would be, huh, I wonder how my spouse would answer that question. Because my desire is not to be a receiver or a taker, but instead to be a giver. And I want my spouse to have exactly the kind of sexual relationship that they would desire. That's an enormous shift of how we think. So let me just name this, and then we'll dive into the passage in just a moment. The scripture's approach to sex is honest, it's healthy, and it's human. A quick word about each one of those three words. It's honest. So Jesus says that he comes to this world full of grace and truth. And the whole conversation in the scriptures about sex and sexuality is all of that. It is marked with grace, and it is marked with truth, and we need all of it. See, when Jesus encountered a woman who was caught in adultery, caught in a sexual sin, it would be good for us to remember how he treated her. First, he protected her. And he let her know that she could have a fresh start. He said, do these people condemn you? Nope, they, I've, I've caused all of them to exit. I don't condemn you either. And then, before she walked away, he said to her, now go and sin no more. I give you a chance to start clean. There's grace in the process. But you have to embrace the truth, and you can't just go back to what you did before. This is the holistic message. It's also healthy. And like anything that's healthy, it probably means that you and I are going to have to not seek instant gratification. That there are places in all of our lives where we have desires where it would feel good, you might want to fulfill the desire immediately, but actually by fulfilling the immediate desire, you cost yourself in the long term. 
You cost the health of relationships and marriages and such. And the conversation that the scriptures give us about sex is the exact opposite. It says, no, you're going to need to limit your desires. You will. For the better and greater good in the long term for you and anyone who's around you. And then the idea is that we're human. And by human, I mean we're not animals. The scriptures give humanity a unique role in this world. That you and I have been created uniquely in the image of God. And that we don't have to give in to every instinct that we have. And that, in fact, and this is very important, that you and I, we have desires inside of us that are very real desires. They are God-given or more likely, more accurately, God-allowed. And just because you have a desire does not mean that desire is meant to be fulfilled. This is one of the great lies that our world tells us these days, that, that if there's a desire inside of you that seems natural, surely there ought to be an outlet for it. You should just be able to fulfill it. But the story of the scriptures for followers of Jesus is entirely the opposite. The story of the scriptures all the time says, no, you will need to yield your own desires. You'll need to delay them or deny them completely in order for your own health and the health and well-being and flourishing of people who are around you. And so it's very important that we understand the scripture's holistic view. Now, let, before I get into single and married, let me name one principle that's true for all followers of Jesus. The way of Jesus is marked by unselfishness. Now, you may not be a follower of Jesus, and if you're not, I'm, of course, thrilled that you're here. I hope that you're exploring and considering becoming a follower of Jesus. I think it means a lot for your life on this earth and your afterlife. But if you are a follower of Jesus, then this is what we take seriously in our covenant with God, to say that the way of following Jesus means others go first, not ourselves. This is maybe Jesus' foundational teaching on this. He says, so in everything... Do to others what you'd have them do to you. This sums up the whole Old Testament. All the law, all the prophets, this is, this is the whole idea. This is what it means to follow Jesus. That in everything, you would not seek your own good, but you would put yourself in another person's shoes and say, hey, I'm going to treat them the way I wish I were treated. Now, the everything part of this makes it really interesting. Because if you're supposed to live like this as a follower of Jesus with your next door neighbor, you're supposed to live like this as a follower of Jesus with your coworker. You're supposed to live like this as a follower of Jesus when you're in traffic. Think about that. Do unto others as you wish they would do to you. That'll change the way you drive to work this week. You're supposed to do this with your enemies. And if we're supposed to do it with our coworkers and our neighbors and in traffic, surely with our spouse, surely with the people who share our home and we share a covenant with, we would take the perspective that this is no longer about me but is instead about the other. That is a fundamental basis. Now, this passage has nothing to do with sex when Jesus teaches it. But what you will find is that as the scriptures start to apply areas of our life, it's always built on this foundation, including the passage from 1 Corinthians 7. So let me talk for just a moment to those of you who are single in the room. Here's the idea of singleness. The single life is a preferred life for a lifetime or perhaps for a season of life the single life is a preferred life now maybe you see the world differently than me but most of the time when i look around outside the church and inside the church it's not viewed this way this world is built for married people churches are built for married people T -t typically you get the idea that singleness is actually second class not a preferred class, but the scriptures tell an entirely different story. This is very important. Um, a few years ago, we had a Highland campus, and I had ha hired uh, Wesley Blackburn to be our Highland campus pastor. If you knew Wesley, you know, he's, he's a great guy, great teacher, good friend, good leader, really, really fantastic uh, pastor. But after I had made him the campus pastor at our Highland campus, um, I got a letter from someone at that campus. Now, if you write me a letter um, you should think through your letter before you write it to me because I will write you back with a response. So this person wrote me a letter and they were complaining. They said, um, hey, Greg, how could you make Wes the campus pastor? He's not even married. He's not even married. That was the basis of the letter. How could we have a pastor who's not married? And so I got out a piece of paper and I wrote this person back and I said, dear, I'll leave the name out. I said, by your definition, 
of who I could hire as the Highland Campus pastor, I could not have hired Jesus. Seriously! <laughs> Jesus wasn't married. The Apostle Paul wasn't married. These two foundational, like this is, but people perceive things this way. They will move single people into a second class, and I think it's, it's terrible. It's not what the scriptures teach at all. So 1 Corinthians chapter 7 speaks to this a little bit. Follow this with me. Apostle Paul says, now for the matters you wrote about. So the Corinthian church, the church in the city of Corinth, had written Paul a letter. They had some questions, probably bullet pointed them. Now he's going to answer those questions. He says, here's your first question. You wrote about sex. He says, it is good for a man not to have sexual relationships, relations with a woman. Now this is very interesting. If you look this passage up in other translations of the Bible, this is important. The New Testament was written in Greek. And so all of our English versions are translations of that Greek. People spend a lot of time, a lot of education trying to translate it correctly. Um, but there's various translations, sometimes some discrepancy in how things are translated. That's true. And many times if you read this passage in other translations, it will say, it is good for a man not to marry. Well, what's going on here in this translation is that from the scripture standpoint, the idea of engaging in a sexual relationship and the idea of Engaging in a vow of marriage are one and the same. They are one and the same. And so it's fair to say it's that he says it's good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. He's also saying it's good for a man not to get married. He goes on. But since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. And here the Apostle Paul advocates to say, if you're going to have a sexual relationship, you need to do it within a marriage to one other person. And he's fighting against some things maybe we don't fight against. Polygamy was a thing in his day, so he's saying, no, it needs to be one. Too many men are out there exploiting women, having multiple wives. He says this should be shared in a single union together. Then he goes on. He, he talks about marriage for a little bit, and he comes back. This is toward the end of the passage. He says, I say this as a concession, not as a command. So he's basically saying, it's okay to get married, but I say that as a concession, not as a command. Don't, don't think it's a command in the Bible that you have to get married. I wish that all of you were as I am. He's saying, I'm single. This, this is an identity that's, that's good in the kingdom of God. But each one of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift, and another has that. And so he acknowledges, singleness is not for everyone. But he also wants to say, but it's for some people. And it's for some people for a lifetime. They have a gift of this. Maybe you'd even call it the gift of celibacy. For some, it's a gift for a season that they have. But whatever way you look at this passage, you cannot say that singleness is second class. In fact, it's quite preferred. <laughs> Here's how he finishes. Now to the unmarried and the widows, I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried as I do. But if they cannot control themselves... They should marry, for it's better to marry than to burn with passion. And of course, when he's describing this burning with passion, you can't, you can't apply that like to a first date. <laughs> All right, this isn't hunk of hunk of burning love. You know, like, oh, yes, we should get married. How about that Elvis reference right there? That's pretty good. So, but this is the idea that if you're in a relationship with someone, and you think you're at the spot where you'd say, I'd like to engage in a sexual relationship, then you should seriously have a conversation with, then we should probably get married. And you want to wait to get married until you fully trust someone, and you feel like you could live with a lifetime vow, but these two things go together in ways that are beautiful and very healthy. It's a message to singleness. Actually, we'll, we'll share a little more about singleness at the end of the message. But let me shift to the part of the conversation about married people. Married life is a serving life. And it's a serving life for a lifetime. It's a vow-oriented life where you say to someone else, for all of my life or till all of your life, till one of us dies, I am here to serve you. And it should not surprise us that when the Apostle Paul goes on to describe the sexual relationship within a marriage, it is on the basis of serving the other. Here's how he describes it. It says, but since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. The husband should fulfill his marital duty. What a romantic Paul is there. <laughs> marital duty to his wife. And likewise, the wife to her husband. Now, I don't want to step off this phrasing of marital duty too quickly because what's the undercurrent here is responsibility. The Apostle Paul is telling people who are married, 
You have a responsibility in your marriage. Sexuality is, a, is not the only part, but it's an important part of marriage. And you have a responsibility to your husband or to your wife to think of them first in this way. It, it, maybe he would cast it this way. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but if you're married, you are the only legitimate source of sexual satisfaction, of romance to your spouse. There is no one else that is a legitimate source according to the scriptures. And so if you decide, I'm not going to participate in that, I'm not going to provide that, I'm going to withhold that, then what you're saying to the person you're supposed to be a giver to is you're saying, I don't ever want you to get to experience that. I don't care how much you want it. I don't ever want you to experience that. I want you to be very limited in your experience of it. Because there's no other legitimate source for it besides you. That's why a healthy sexual relationship that's marked by healthy conversation and lots of healthy pursuing and romance, very important part of the marriage. It goes on. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her, her husband. Now, guys, before you think that that on its own is a standalone idea and it means you're in charge, you'll want to read the next sentence, which says the exact same thing about husbands. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but he yields his body to his wife. And you might be listening to that and you'd think, oh my goodness. That would take a tremendous amount of trust to actually just kind of release my body entirely to, the, to my spouse. And I'm saying, yes, it would. That's the nature of a marriage vow. You should not get married until you're prepared to be that vulnerable and that trusting in someone else. And I know that the moment I describe this, there's plenty of people sitting in this room who would say, but that's not the story in my life. I'd say, listen to this. This is particularly about sexuality, but it's completely on the foundation of what Jesus taught us about all of our relationships. And then later on, when the Apostle Paul just talks about marriage in general in Ephesians chapter 5, he's going to say this, Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Yield to them. Enter into this covenant with someone you can be a giver with. And it's going to say, Husbands, you love your wives like Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. The whole idea of marriage is that it's selfless. And the moment you're in your marriage and your main concern is your own deeds, your own desires, your own expectations, and you think, I'm mad, she's not giving me what I want, he's not giving me what I want. Well, that, that causes marriages to spiral downward. Because when one person becomes selfish, the other person will become selfish. And then you have two people who are pulling apart, only wanting their own desires. The Christian picture of marriage is entirely the opposite, including sexuality. That it means you would look at your spouse and say, "My, what I want is for you to be satisfied. That's what I want. I want your desires to be met. I want to meet your expectations. I want to help you find joy and happiness. And in a healthy marriage, can you picture this? I know, I know this seems like a panacea to some, but in a healthy marriage, when you're giving like that to the other person, it means that he or she is satisfied. And then, of course, they're living with the same posture and giving like that back to you so that you are satisfied. And this is the picture of all of marriage, of a sexual relationship within a marriage that God wants to paint as a model for the world. That it is an unselfish giving relationship. Paul has to put one more word of warning on this. He says, let me be clear. Do not deprive each other, except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time to devote yourselves to prayer. The, the framework of this whole conversation about, hey, in your marriage, would there ever be a season where you don't engage one another physically? Would there ever be a season like that? Here's what the Apostle Paul is saying. You say, well, it's kind of like fasting. 
There's a spiritual practice of fasting where you go without food for a certain time so you can devote yourself to prayer. Maybe within your marriage, if you have something you really need to pray about, you would say, we're going to fast from our sexual relationship so that we can pray and seek God. But the one thing you cannot do is weaponize this part of your relationship. See, people take this part of their relationship and they use it as a tool, as leverage. They say, well, he's not getting it, she's not getting it. I'm not pursuing it. That. And they, they do it to get what they want, of course. And the Apostle Paul, it's almost like he's saying, listen, that's a bad idea no matter what, but if you're going to do it, use something else. Do not use your sexual relationship as a leverage point and deprive the other person. Then, if you've fasted from it, Come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. And of course, in a healthy marriage, and many of you will have to just go first, say, if it's going to be a healthy marriage, I'm, I'm going to start to be the giver. In a healthy marriage, you would be so concerned with the person you're married to to say, there's a drive inside of them. And it's not right if they would seek satisfaction outside the marriage. It's not justifiable to seek satisfaction outside the marriage. But it's actually very common if this relationship within the marriage isn't healthy. As a married person, you have to remember, you are the only legitimate source of romance and of sexual satisfaction for whoever you're married to. So I have the marriage perspective. I've been married for 21 years. Um, but I felt like it was very important when we planned this series and, and communicated this, that it wasn't just married voices or just male voices leading the, the way. And so I actually want to invite uh, someone to help finish this message for me. I'm going to have Lindsay Wilson come up here. Lindsay's on our staff. She's the director of our uh, kids' ministry for elementary age, and she does an amazing, as most of you know, an amazing and remarkable job. We love having her on our team. As she sat with us and helped uh, plan this teaching series, she was a voice that was just gold, I thought, to, to me and to our process. And so, uh, Lindsay's single, and I want you to hear uh, for a few minutes here just a little bit about her experience. So, um, Lindsay, why don't you just give us kind of the, the big picture about your experience? I'm 35, I'm single, and I get that that's an anomaly today. It's weird in the church, it's weird in the world, and even as Greg mentioned earlier, being single sometimes even feels second class. Uh, most churches offer really great college and single groups as long as you're between 20 and 30. And then it's just kind of assumed that once you hit 30, you're probably gonna be married and have kids by then. When you go to a social or work event, the first questions you always get asked are, oh, do you have kids of your own? Or are you married? Or, well, are you dating anybody? And when the answers are no, they kind of look at you like, but you're how old? <laughs> so I just want you to hear that I get it and I have been there and know the pain of feeling alone, what it's like to ask and pray for your turn and your person, um, always being the third wheel and the bridesmaid, uh, searching for people in the same category of life as you so you don't feel so out of place. Singleness can be lonely but it can also be a gift. And I would say it's taught me a lot about patience and trust. So talk about that loneliness a little bit because that's a powerful force. Being single and feeling alone can often lead to lust, pornography, sleeping around, desperation that leads to dating the wrong people, or that loneliness can actually lead to a greater relationship with God and a deeper trust in his plan for you. I know we often feel labeled and even label ourselves as single, but one thing I've learned is that's not where my identity lies. Fundamentally, I am a child of God, and when I get to those low, lonely places in my life, it's just a reminder to me that my heart's in the wrong place and I'm desiring the wrong things, because my identity is in Christ. It's not in my husband or even a lack of one. Um, I am his bride, and I am unconditionally loved by him. No, don't get me wrong. I do want to get married one day. I just want to make sure that it's the right person that God has planned for me and not just someone that I'm willing to settle for just because I'm getting older. Waiting for a date, waiting to meet my future husband or wife, you know, waiting to meet your spouse, waiting to get married, waiting to, you know, have a family of your own can be really tough. And 
honestly, it sometimes feels like those things are just never going to happen for me. So, Lindsay, you and I have talked a little bit about some practices, really some prayers that you've put in place. I want you to share that with everyone. I would say there's three things. Um, one, just pray every day for your future spouse. Some of you may think, yeah, yeah, I already do that. But I'm not talking about the, like, dear Lord, could you please give me a husband and soon would be great prayers. Like, I'm talking about specific prayers. Like, what traits and qualities and characteristics do you want in a spouse? Pray for those things. Uh, two, pray every day for you as a future spouse. I know I want to be the person that my husband deserves and who he's praying for. And so those same qualities that I'm praying for in him, I'm also asking that the Lord will just grow and develop those same things in me. And, you know, I was once convicted by the quote, are you who the one you're looking for is looking for? And finally, I would just say, um, thank God every day for the gift of singleness. This past September, I was, I had a conversation with my brother-in-law who has been married to my sister for about six years. And I had flown to Charlotte for the day. And of course, the first question I get asked is, oh, are you dating anybody there yet? And my answer was still no. And his response was, you know, I love being married to Leslie and I love our kids, but I also really loved and cherished my time of being single. He said, it allowed me to serve God all the time. And I stood there in the garage that day and knew that he was right, uh, but I can honestly say that I had never considered being 35 and single as a gift. But it is. I have more time and resources to love and serve God and love and serve others and help build his kingdom than most people my age. So I challenged myself that day to start a journal of reasons to be grateful for this season of singleness. And every day, I just write down one thing that I was able to do that day because I'm single. It hasn't solved everything or made every day easy, but it has helped change my perspective and my attitude on being single and allows me to see it now as a gift instead of as a burden or sometimes even as a punishment. So adding those three things into my prayer life has just been really good for me. And if you're single here today, I would just challenge you to pray for those same things. Yeah, let me... Let me just echo that briefly. If you're single and you didn't write those three things down, you should totally go back and write them down right now. This is, this is so important as it shapes your view of God. So uh, anything else, just kind of perspective giving for you? If I had been married at 28 or 30, like most of my friends, I know that I would not be at Suncrest today. I would not have picked up my life to move across the country for a job if I had been married and had kids. So God has a plan, God has my person, God wants to give me the desires of my heart, and he even wants me to have sex one day. So just remember to trust him in the waiting and honor him in the process. So I, for one, of course, am very grateful that, uh, that Lindsay did come to Suncrest and serves here. And I would really just ask you for a moment just to show her your appreciation for sharing this with us. It's really important to me that we're a diverse community at Suncrest, the married, single, male, female, all of it. Um, and so just to close the message in prayer today, um, Lindsay and I are both going to offer a prayer, but I actually asked her to pray for those of you who are married. And I want to pray for those of you who are single. Um, and just before we kind of bow our head and close our eyes, I'll ask this. If, you're, if you happen to be sitting next to the person you're married to, or just someone you're in a relationship with if you're not married, uh, would you grab their hand right now as we pray? God, we just thank you for the married men and women in this room. Thank you for creating marriage, and thank you for the beautiful picture of trust and vulnerability that marriage can be. I pray specifically right now for those struggling relationships and those who may feel hopeless. God, may today mark a moment of decision to be unselfish, and I thank you for great marriages in this room where both husbands and wives are putting the other before themselves. God, I pray that trusting and obeying you is where we all center our lives. And God, I, I echo that idea that our trust in you leading to our obedience to you. It's just part of navigating this, this life. We know our human relationships are, are shaped by your way. And I pray we let you lead it. 
God, for those who are single in this room, I pray that they find a certain satisfaction in that singleness. That whether this is for a season or for a lifetime, it does lead to greater trust in you and greater impact for you. And God, if for each person in this room who's single and wants to be married, they have that desire in them. I pray, God, that you would provide in your time a healthy man or woman, a man or woman of Christian faith that they can share their deepest identity with. God bless our church in this way. In Jesus' name.